If you love classic cars, then Donald loves you. Hi, and welcome back to Balance and Power, the world on two wheels, 1885 to 1995. I'm here again with Chuck Gilchrist, and we are here with a totally different kind of Honda. We're a far cry from the 55 here, aren't we, Chuck? To say the least, Donald, Honda in the um, mid-60s was making bikes up to 500 cc's, twin-cylinder motorcycles, but they thought they would really stick it to the other manufacturers by taking it up a couple of notches and came out with the Honda CB750K. This was a rocket ship and arguably could be considered to be the first real superbike when you compare it with what was available at the time. Four cylinders, four carburetors, disc brakes. Wow, on a motorcycle? It was unheard of. And uh, we, we were talking before, Chuck, about the fact that this is a really, really, really fast bike. And if you have a bike that can go this fast, you want to make sure that it can stop. Not only disc brake, but thinned brakes for added cooling capacity. I mean, this is a serious performance machine. And uh, I love small bore uh, cars, and especially small bore racing cars, which typically had 750cc four cylinder engines. And here you've got that in a motorcycle. So the power to weight ratio in this is just outrageous. Well, this is a bike that was very sophisticated. And in addition to being called the first superbike, probably started the trend towards Japanese touring bikes as well. Because not only was this a great performance bike, but it was quiet, it was comfortable, and you could carry two people on it very, very comfortably and go long distances with no mechanical problems, which was pretty much unheard of at the time. And this was aimed squarely at the US market. The U.S. motorcycle market had become the biggest in the world at this point, and it was still, in the, certainly in the early 60s and the mid-60s, the British still had the dominant, was still the dominant force in the motorcycle market, especially for the larger displacement bikes. Is that correct? Absolutely. And not only were they the top-level performance bikes, they were also number one at the sales floor as well. So with Honda, uh, having the natural progression going from 50 cc's to 200 cc's, to 300, to 500, now they had something to play with the big boys because the bikes coming out of Britain at the time were 650 cc's. American bikes were 750s and 1,000 cc motorcycles. So they wanted to play with the big boys and they certainly achieved that with the 750K. And this motorcycle was received rapturously by the press and it was new in all the reviews in the famous Cycle Magazine uh, shootout it performed very, very well, and a lot of people say that it is, it did for Honda and motorcycles what the Acura NSX did later for cars. It, it proved that Honda could punch in a field that nobody ever thought they could. You mentioned its popularity. When it was introduced, the uh, prototype for the bike had such a huge reception that when they went into production with it, they didn't have the tooling ready to actually make the motors. So they actually sandcast the first model year uh, of, of the crankcases on these bikes. As such, those bikes now, the first model year CB750Ks with the sandcast cases are extremely rare and extremely collectible. This is also a very interesting thing that, that sometimes happens, but it defies the, the basic rules of collectability because oftentimes something that is very, very popular when it's new, that they produce lots of, you say, well, interest and, and value comes with rarity. But these bikes were not rare, they were very successful, very popular, but that popularity has definitely translated into collectability. It's a very collectible motorcycle. Well, you could also say that this would be the equivalent of, say, a, a Ford Mustang from that standpoint. They made tons of them, but they were so well received that people want them, they want to relive their youth with them, and the CB750 certainly fills the bill there. I would also add that its very first go-round, I believe in 1969, it won the Daytona 200 at the, with a uh, uh, pilot Dick Bugsy Mann, one of the top American road racers, uh, twisting the throttle on there. It was a uh, 
not a factory effort, but they went out and won Daytona right from the get-go. So they knew they had a winner. So is this the moment when this motorcycle was introduced that the sun began to set for the British Empire's motorcycles? It did, and it also was a kick in the butt to the rest of the Japanese motorcycle industry because they realized if they don't come out with something that is four-stroke, multi-cylinder, good performing, and looks great, they're gonna be left in the dust. And as we saw in history, Kawasaki, Yamaha, and Suzuki all responded in kind with their own four-stroke, four-cylinder motorcycles. And this great effort certainly also was a warning bell to Harley-Davidson, even though they probably didn't see it at the time. Well, Harley-Davidson at that time uh, was being acquired by American Machine and Foundry, or AMF, and they had a lot of uh, issues internally. Uh, they were also very, very slow to adapt new technologies. And um, this was a bike that didn't leak. Unfortunately, Harleys were known for having <laughs> a little bit of oil control problems and, um, and very, very reliable. It didn't leave you stranded alongside the road. Um, back in the day, there was the, the, the rhyme of Harley, Harley made of tin, ride them out and push them in. <laughs> Perhaps unfair, but nonetheless, <laughs> in, in, in all of these cliches is the kernel of truth. That is true. Let's take a look at another Honda from this era that is also a very, very, very special motorcycle. True. Now, Chuck, in this show, we don't focus on racing bikes. We have a few racing bikes in the show, but this is something certainly more overtly sporting. So tell us about this one. This is a 1976 Honda CB. 400F Super Sport. And Honda had made a 350 four-cylinder motorcycle shortly after they introduced the 754, but they realized that there was a strong desire for young racers, people in their te late teens, early 20s, to get involved in motorcycle competition. And at that time, Honda really didn't have a player in that arena. So they came up with a smaller version of the 750 Supersport, which debuted in 1976, along with a 550 Supersport. But this was the one that really caught on. The 400F was a great bike. It had wonderful performance. It wasn't a pure racer, but it was definitely geared towards the sporting motorcyclist. And what was this bike's competition when it was new? Well, uh, it had a few different competitors. It would compete against equivalent motorcycles from Yamaha, like the 400 RD. Uh, it would also race against uh, 380cc two-stroke two -stroke engines, uh, motorcycles from Suzuki. So, uh, and the Kawasaki 400 as well, which was a three-cylinder two-stroke. Uh, as such, this one wasn't really the fastest of the bunch, but it had great handling. It had a lot more curb appeal because it was quiet uh, and it looked the part of a Honda race motorcycle. You mentioned the fact that it handled well. I think that balance was one of the key things to Honda's success in this category at this time. Is that not correct? Very much so. Uh, Honda had a bike that was maybe a little bit heavier than its competition, but the suspension was up to the task. Uh, it had a very tractable power band. In other words, you had enough torque that you didn't have to rev it up to you know, seven or 8,000 RPM all the time to make it go, get down the road. And there's plenty of uh, stories of people taking these motorcycles cross country um, as small displacement touring bikes for solo, uh, solo cross country rides. Again, a very interesting thing, we were talking about that with the uh, Honda 55. The versatility of the Honda bikes in all the categories really was one of the things that really helped not only establish their reputation, but their popularity with riders. The 1970s really saw a trend towards specialized motorcycling. And the motorcycles that were purpose-built for competition or for trail riding or for motocross or touring uh, became far more specialized, and as a result, there were more and more different choices on the showroom floor, both at Honda and other motorcycle dealerships. That was actually a real uh, feather in the cap for Honda, whereas some of the other manufacturers, maybe BMW, Harley-Davidson, and Triumph, 
really only made a few different motorcycles that were focused on the larger touring market. And when we were chatting, you talked about the incredible model proliferation in the Honda line. You mentioned just now four different uh, capacities, engine capacities, just in this general uh, sphere, and then models on models there. Was that necessarily aimed at a very specific rider, or they just wanted to make sure that they covered everything that people could possibly ask for? Well, back in the late 1970s, many of the Japanese motorcycle manufacturers were making what they refer to as custom or limited or special versions of specific motorcycles in different size categories. So at one point you had, I believe in 1982, six motorcycles from Honda in the 750cc category, just so that they would hit that very specific niche or styling cues that the motorcyclist wanted. They might've wanted a, an LTD, or they might've wanted a uh, custom, or they might've wanted a super sport. They were there for the choosing. It is something, again, that shows at this point in time sociologically that motorcycles had become absolutely accepted in the U.S. market across all income and demographic ranges. And so at this point, it is no longer something that's for the outlaw. It's not for the bad boy. It's for everybody to use both for sport and for practical everyday use. So how did a bike like this also influence Honda's touring bike business? Well, it served as a bit of an entry level for the Honda uh, touring bikes. It was very difficult to find a 200 or 350 cc motorcycle coming from the European manufacturers that a person could buy, learn how to ride, and then move up to a larger motorcycle. Honda has always believed in the progressive sales concept of you start somebody small and you work them up to the largest and the most comfortable, and in some cases, the most expensive model that's in the showroom. It makes a lot of sense. And it's a perfect example of the incredible range of motorcycles that you can see here in this exhibition. And Chuck, your enthusiasm and expertise has helped to create this exhibition. And we thank you so much for sharing it with us here in the museum and with all of our fans out on the Audrain Museum Network. Thank you, Donald.